Let's gather together and let's praise God this morning. Encamped along the hills of light. Good morning, church. Glad to see everyone here. And welcome to our visitors that are online. We're certainly blessed today with the rain. And it's a surprise. A um, couple of announcements. The youth group parent meeting this morning will be after the second service in adult classroom A. That's across from adult classroom B. Roundhouse tonight for, for the kids are from 4 to 6.30 at the Blaylocks in Kemp. Girls, uh, y'all bring the desserts. Guys, bring the drinks. Wear a, it says wear camp-appropriate swimwear. Well, be prepared. Be prepared. All right. Roundhouse hosts are needed. Please sign up. Uh, the, the bulletin boards are down the hallway. Please do that. A reminder that we have the offering baskets at the back tables with uh, our communion. Again, we are certainly glad that you're here today at the 9 o'clock worship. And to our visitors, we always thank you for being here. Uh, f please fill out a card or go online and the card online. I am not a techie person, but I'm glad a lot of people are. All right, great to see y'all. Good morning, everybody. There's room for y'all to bring your friends on this beautiful day. We've been wondering a long time when we was going to get some rain. Now it's getting us wet. That's okay. Uh, I want everybody to remember Ronnie Cortez. Pray for him. Give him strength. Is that right? His mother, Mary, passed. His wife, wife, okay. Um, some things, the rain makes you happy, but tragedy seems to dampen it. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you put upon us. Thank you for the load that you take away when the burdens get too heavy. Give us strength in our time of weakness and, our, and faith in our time when the weakness and the burdens seem to overtake us. May we also remember the people that have been burdened by the recent hurricanes. 
May the Lord give them strength to hold their head up, depend on their faith, and gather themselves up and carry on. All the good things that you give us, Lord, are just blessings that we cannot count. Help us to take Mike's message today with us and remember it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. standing for our next song this morning. This will be our song uh, before we sing, uh, before we gather around the table for communion. And if you have not uh, gotten your, uh, picked up your communion cups uh, during the singing of this song, uh, we invite you to do that. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died.
Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of, spirit, of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness, righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit heavenly father we uh, we read your word and we know that you always say what you're going to do and we can depend on you and we know that uh, when we give our lives to you to have our relationship with you that you forgive us and we will have a home in heaven with you because you always do what you say you'll do fathers we contemplate this great uh, blessing today the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross I pray that we each one Resolve in our hearts to live by the Spirit and walk by faith. Not depending on the world and what the world says. We look out into the world today and we see uh, anger, frustration, fear because of the circumstances that are going on. I pray that we uh, reach out, encourage others to see what you can offer them and, and uh, faith and comfort and blessings. Father, bless us as we take this bread in memory of that sacrifice and help us celebrate it, that it gives us confidence in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, Lord of ours, Father, as we as we drink your drink this as we drink this fruit of the vine, we do so in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Bless us sinners and have mercy on our souls. In Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning will be coming from Romans 4, 18 through 25 of the New Living Translation. <clears throat> Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was good as dead and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. 
He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteousness. And when God counted him as righteousness, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will always count us as all righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Jesus, name above all invite you one more time. Let's please be standing as we sing the song before uh, Brother Mike uh, brings the lesson this morning. I care not to name what the morrow may bring. It shall or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know truly the Lord everything and all of my worry is named.
Welcome to everybody here today. We're glad to see you here. I just want to remind everybody why we are here. We are here to worship God. And worship, as I've told you many times, as you know from God's Word, worship is a verb. We are meant to participate in worship. That means to sing. That means to engage our hearts and minds during a time of teaching. When we have the Lord's Supper like we did this morning, not to just go through it like we do every Sunday, but to really engage our minds and to think about the incredible plan that God had for us. And that plan was to send the man, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. So I want to encourage everybody now, as we have this time of teaching, to engage your hearts and your minds, because I have a powerful lesson for us today. Ken did a really good job of picking songs that really connect, especially that last song, Living by Faith. There's no need to be alarmed because I know that no matter what air be tied, God's, I forgot the exact words, but you don't have to worry because, uh, because God, uh, God's going to take care of everything. And we need to know that, especially in very uncertain times like this. Um, that's, the book of Genesis is such an incredible book. Uh, this has been one of my favorite studies that I've ever done. I've taught through a lot of books of the Bible, but I've really studied a lot on the book of Genesis there's so many very practical, relevant truths. And one of the things that we see in Genesis, we see these incredible foundations laid that are going to perpetuate throughout all the rest of Scripture. And of course, today we're going to talk a lot about faith. And what we're going to see is, as I've said before, uh, the people have always been saved by faith. It's a misnomer that we think, well, people were saved by keeping the law in the Old Testament. No, they weren't. No one, that was never even the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to show people that you can't do it. You can't keep all 613 of those laws perfectly all the time. You need something outside of that law, and that's what the Old Testament is always pointing to. It's pointing to the Messiah who was one day to come. And especially in the life of Abraham, we see some very, very foundational truths, incredible truths that are going to continue on throughout all of Scripture, and especially today, one of the most foundational passages we're going to look at that's repeated over and over again in the New Testament, and something that we really need to know. Last week, the point last week, which is really an incredible thought if you think about it, No matter how bitter life might be, God's always at work to bless you. We need to hear that, don't we? It's easy for us to get discouraged when difficulties and problems and bitter circumstances happen in this life. And it happens to all of us. If you will remember this, no matter what happens, no matter what happens to you personally, no matter what happens in your family, no matter what may happen to our country or the world, God is always at work to bless you. That's an incredible truth that we saw last week in the life of Abraham. When Abraham had bitter circumstances that happened to him, you remember? His nephew Lot bamboozled him out of the best of the land, took advantage of him, and people will take advantage of you if you are trying to live your life for the Lord. God blessed Abraham anyway. And that's good for us to know. No matter what happens, no matter how bitter life might be, No matter how negative of a turn things may happen in your life, God is always at work to bless you. Now, today, here's why we all need to really listen. We're going to look at another very foundational truth of Scripture that is so needed. You know, I've been a preacher for a long time, and we have lived in lots of different places all different, not all different regions, but several different regions of the country, big churches, small churches, medium-sized churches, big cities, small towns like this one, and everything in between. I have noticed that no matter where you go, no matter what town, what region, what church that you go to, uh, there's one foundational truth that a lot of people just don't get. And it's not one of these peripheral kind of things in Scripture. This is at the very core of what Scripture is about. To illustrate that, let me tell you a story, a true story, about a a great lady in in another church where we served a long time ago. This lady was a woman of faith. I mean, she had been a member of, of the body of Christ for a long, long time, a lot longer than I had been. 
She would be at our church service every single Sunday. She helped to serve in various ways in that church, doing things behind the scenes that so many of you ladies do to bless other people's lives. And then later in her life, she got very, very ill. In fact, she was on her deathbed. She knew she was dying. She knew it was going to happen soon. And I remember being at her in her hospital room there and talking with her. And here's what was so sad. This is a woman who had trusted in Jesus, who believed in Jesus, followed Jesus her whole life. And this woman was scared to death. She was scared to die. And here's the reason. She told me this. She said, I'm just so afraid that I haven't done enough. And I was trying to talk with her and let her assure her that your salvation is not dependent on how much you do. That is so important for us to understand. There is no way you can do enough to deserve to earn a spot with God in heaven for eternity. I pray that everybody will understand that. Because if you don't understand that, if you think that your is spot in eternity and your future salvation, if you think it is dependent upon how good you have been, if you think it is dependent upon how many good things you have done, how perfectly you have lived God's law, your life is going to be miserable. And you're never going to have any assurance of your salvation. There's another lady that everybody in here knows. She goes to our church. I'm not going to mention her name, but everybody knows her. She's here every single Sunday. Has a great family, a great woman of faith. This person has been a member of the church for, grew up in the church, been a member of the church for a long, long time. Years ago, she told me, she said, you know what? She said, until I started coming to this church, I never thought I had any hope of going to heaven. And I'm like, what? And I said, tell me what you mean by that. She said, because I had been at churches all my life, and here's what I heard. The sermons were hellfire and brimstone. If you don't get everything exactly right, if you don't do everything exactly right, if you don't live perfectly, if you don't walk that line exactly on a tightrope, then you have no hope of heaven. She thought, I never thought I had any hope. And one of the things I was glad of that what she heard me teaching was, look, we're not saved by how perfectly we do things. We're saved by the only one who was perfect. Brothers and sisters, this is why we need to pay close attention today. Everybody needs to know how they can know for certain that they're going to heaven. How can you know for certain beyond a shadow of a doubt? How can you know that you're going to be saved. That is so important. That's why everybody needs to listen today because we're going to see as I unfold God's word, here is how we can know. And yes, you can know. There's even a verse, as we know, in 1 John that says that. You can know. I have written to you, John says, these things so that you can know that you have eternal life. And so we're going to discover this in this, in this message about Abraham the Bible says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He said, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. I'm your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my state, estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you've given me no children. He's accusing God. And so a servant in my household will be my heir. Now you've got to understand, you remember back in chapter 12, God had promised Abraham, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing. You're going to have, I'm going to make a great nation of you. That was 10 years ago when Abraham was 75 years old. Right now, Abraham is 85 years old. Still, he has, had, he has no child. He is impotent. His wife remains barren. They have no children. How is, he, he's questioning, how is this going to happen? And God tells him, Abraham, don't be afraid. Now, here's probably what Abraham was afraid of couple of things. If you look back in chapter 14, he had just had to go and rescue his nephew Lot from some warlords in the land. And he was afraid that they were going to get retribution on him. That's one thing that he is afraid of. 
But the other thing he's afraid of is it's just never going to happen. I know God has said it, but I don't see any evidence of this happening. I'm 85 years old now. Ten years has gone by since God made the promise. Think about it. If God made a promise to you or someone made a promise to you ten years ago and it still has not happened yet, wouldn't you begin to think, I think he forgot about it or he's not able to do it. God says, I'm telling you, I haven't forgotten about it. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. It's not going to be one of your servants. You yourself and Sarah, you are going to have a child. And then this verse, the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man's not going to be your heir. Eliezer, your servant, he's not going to be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood, he's going to be your heir. This says he took him outside and he said, I want you to look up at the sky and the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham is looking up there in the sky. And I'm sure many of us have done that on a clear night in a place where there aren't many lights. There's innumerable numbers of stars, and those are just the ones that we can see with the naked eye. There are billions of them everywhere. And God says, as many as those stars are, that's how many your ancestors are going to be. And then this verse, this next verse, is one of the most foundational verses in the entire Bible. If we understand what this is saying, it'll completely revolutionize our life. The Bible says... Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Abram believed what God was saying. There was no evidence for it other than what God had said. He's 85 years old. His wife is 75 years old at this time. 75-year-old women even then don't have children, and they certainly don't now. But the Bible says that Abraham believes the Lord. This word believes means he, he, he trusts what God is saying. He is resting everything upon the bare word of God simply because God has said it. And Abraham belie believes to the extent that he begins to organize his whole life around what God has said. His lifestyle changes. His life changes. That's what genuine faith is. When the Bible says Abraham believed the Lord, it's interesting that the word for believed in Hebrew is the same root word that we get our word amen from. And amen, what we are saying when we say amen, it means we are asserting that I agree with that. Yes, that is true. Abraham is asserting, he's saying, yes, God, I believe you. I trust what you're saying, even though there's no evidence of it. And the Bible says the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, I want everybody to get this. This is so important. This verse is one of the most often repeated verses in the New Testament. Paul quotes it in Romans, the passage that Ricky read just a moment ago. He's going to quote it again in Galatians chapter 3, and then Jesus' brother James is going to quote it in his book in chapter 2. One of the most often quoted verses in the New Testament because it is so foundational. It says the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. I want you to notice something about this. This is before Abraham was circumcised. Abraham's not going to be circumcised until 14 years later. Abraham is a Gentile being counted as righteous. This is a great message to the Jews if they were really to think about it. Abraham's not a Jew at this point. He's a Gentile. Hadn't been circumcised yet. This is before the law of Moses. The law of Moses is not going to be instituted for over 400 years after this. And way before that, because of his faith, God counts him as righteous. Notice it says he counts him as righteous. I think we've noticed already in Abraham's life, he was not a perfect man. He's already lied on one occasion we've seen. And these are just the episodes that are recorded. There's going to be another occasion when he's going to go lie about his wife again because he, because he is afraid because he's afraid. God says, I'm going to count you like you're righteous. You're not righteous, but I'm going to count you like you are because I see your genuine faith. And faith that is genuine is faith that changes your life. One thing we all need to ask ourselves, 
The kind of faith that you have, has it changed your life? If your faith hasn't changed your life in any kind of way, then it is not biblical saving faith. Now, Abraham wants some evidence. And so look what he says. He said to him, the Lord said to Abraham, I'm the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But notice what Abraham said. Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'm going to gain possession of it? I don't own anything in this land yet. You said you're going to give me the possession of this land. How can I know? I want some certainty. This is not a lack of faith. It's like us. We, we want to know. We want some evidence. And in one of the strangest ceremonies in the Bible, strange to us but not strange to them, here's what God does. Here's how they ratified covenants in ancient days. What they would do is they would take an animal and they would split it in par apart. They would have it. And they would lay the animal. Part of it they would lay right here and part of it they would lay right there. And the parties who were making the covenant, both of them would walk between the severed animal. And what that was doing is they were saying, I am making this promise to you and it is so solemn, I'm making my promise so much that if I break the covenant that I'm making with you, may what happened to that severed animal, may that happen to me. That's what it means when they walk between it. That's how they made a covenant. And that's what the ensuing passages go on to say. And then the Bible says, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and it passed between these pieces. The animal that had been severed, one side was here and one side was here, something that looked like a blazing fire pot passed between the animals. And on that day, it says, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And he said, to your descendants I'm going to give this land from the wadi of Egypt all the way to the great river, U the Euphrates, this huge amount of land. Now I want you to notice something here. God is the one who passes between the severed animals. That's what this smoking fire pot and this blazing torch represents. It represents the presence of God. In Scripture, fire is often used to represent the presence of God. You might remember in the book of Exodus, I'm sure you're familiar with, that at night there was a, a flame of fire that guided the Israelites through the wilderness. That's the presence of God. You might remember on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20 and following, there's, this, there's fire and smoke billowing from the top of Mount Sinai. That represents the presence of God. What God does on this occasion, God himself in this form called a theophany, where God himself comes down in this form, he passes between these severed animals. Abraham doesn't pass between God is saying, it's all on me. I am the one who's making this covenant, and it's so certain and it's so sure that I'm going to go between these halved animals, and may what happened to those animals happen to me if I don't keep my covenant. Now, the point that I'm about to bring up is really foundational again. This is so crucial for us in our Christian walk. Here's what God is saying in these passages to us. God has certified with his own blood that he counts us as righteous when he sees genuine faith. Brothers and sisters, if we understand what this is saying, it will completely revolutionize your life. God, when he sees your genuine faith, he counts you like you're righteous. Now, you're not righteous, and I'm not either. But he counts us like we are. He counts us as if we are as pure as his son Jesus Christ. And God has certified it with the sacrifice of his very own self. Jesus was God who came down here in the form of a human being. That is how certain it is. And when God sees our genuine faith, it's not perfect faith. You know what? Abraham's faith wasn't perfect, was it? He had lapses, as we've already seen, and we have lapses. God's not looking for perfection in you. He's looking for direction. As long as you're going that direction, seeking God, following Him, putting your faith and trust in Him, though we have lapses and though it's not perfect, He counts us like we're righteous. What does that mean? That means that you can be absolutely certain of your salvation as long as you continue to believe and trust in Him. And so many people need to hear that. In the New Testament, Paul says it this way, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And he did it by becoming a curse for us. 
He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now here in this passage, Paul is talking about Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, thinking that by keeping all of the law of Moses perfectly, you can be saved. Now that is not any of our problem, but we have a problem of thinking we can be saved by law keeping. And the principle is still the same. That's what this sweet lady on her deathbed was thinking. I have to keep all these laws perfectly. I have to get everything right. She thought she was saved by law keeping. You know why she thought that? Because that's what she heard all of her life. This other sweet lady who goes to our church, who will probably be here in a little bit, that everybody knows if I mentioned her name, and is a great person, has a wonderful family, is a person of faith. What she was told all of her life until she started coming here was, I'm saved by law keeping. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law and from the curse of law keeping. It's a curse because none of us can do it and we all know it. He redeemed us from that. He became a curse for us. Why? So that the blessing given to Abraham would come on us. And that is, when I see your faith, it's not perfect, but it's real and it's genuine. When I, when I see that, I'm going to count you like you're righteous. And we have received the promise of the Spirit. God says, here's how I'm going to show you even more. I'm going to give you my very own presence to come and live and dwell in you to assure you of your salvation. And in the book of Romans, part of that passage that Ricky read just a minute ago, for the first couple of chapters of Romans, Paul has said this. He said, you know what? The whole world is guilty before God. All have sinned. They fall short of the glory of God. The Gentiles are guilty before God. And the Jews are going, yeah, I preach it, Brother Paul. And then he says in chapter 2, by the way, you're guilty too. See, they thought that because they were Jews, because they were heirs of Abraham, that they weren't guilty. They had a free ticket. He said, no, no, you're guilty too. You all stand condemned before God. And then in chapter 3, he says, everybody is guilty. And then in chapter 4, he starts giving the answer to it about how we can all be justified, not by works, not by being perfect, but we're justified or we're made right with God through faith in Jesus. And he says this, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. He's giving an example here from the life of King David. This is quoting Psalm chapter 32. And what Psalm 32 is all about is David pouring out his heart to God after he has broken half the Ten Commandments. In that episode with Bathsheba, where he committed lust, he committed adultery, he committed murder, he lied, he stole. He broke half of the Ten Commandments, covetousness. What David understands is, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. My deeds were lawless, they were wrong, but I'm blessed because they're forgiven. And my sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. It's the most blessed thing in the world that God doesn't count your sin against you. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That's the gospel. And we all need to understand this. I wish that lady on her deathbed had understood it. Now, I'm certain she's in heaven. It would just be great if you had that peace going through your whole life. And I'm so glad the lady that goes to our church now, I'm so glad now she understands it. Because it gives her a lot of peace and a lot of assurance to know this, that God has certified with his own blood that he counts us as righteous when he sees our genuine faith. And to kind of nail this down, let me give you another illustration. I remember a long time ago in the 70s when I was growing up, I was in Cub Scouts and then Weeblos and then Boy Scouts. And when I was in Boy Scouts, I only earned maybe three or four merit badges. <laughs> I was good at making fire and I think not making and camping. I got the merit badge for that and something else. And that was about it. But uh, some people achieve a lot more rank than that. Some people achieve Eagle Scout. Actually, very few, though. Only 4% of all Boy Scouts ever achieve Eagle Scout. It's incredibly difficult. You have to earn all of these merit badges. You have to go through all these different hoops and do all these things and, and be certified. Only 4% of all Scouts ever do it. But I'll never forget this. In our Boy Scout troop, there was a guy in our troop. His name was Rudy. I don't remember his last name, but I can, I can see his face right now. He was in a wheelchair. I think he had muscular dystrophy or something like that. 
And his body was just wilting away. He was a shell of what boys should be at, at that age. And we all felt very sorry for, Ru for Rudy, but he was a part of our, of our Boy Scout troop. And when they learned, the leaders of our Boy Scout troop learned that Rudy didn't have long to live. Whatever disease it was, was taking its toll. He was literally wilting away. and He was going to be dying pretty soon. i never forget this. They called us all together for a special ceremony. And they made Rudy an Eagle Scout. They pinned, they brought him up front and everybody was there and lots of other troops were there and we had this big ceremony and they pinned all of these merit badges on him. They had these sashes going across with merit badges on him and they proclaimed him, they counted him as if he were an Eagle Scout. They proclaimed him that you are an Eagle Scout and he was just smiling and beaming from ear to ear. Now he hadn't earned those merit badges. He couldn't. He was incapable of doing it, but they counted him like a full eagle scout. That is exactly what God does with us. We can't earn our salvation. We're incapable of doing it. There's no way we're able to be perfect. There's no way, way we're able to keep God's laws perfectly. I doubt any of us will get through today doing it perfectly, and you know that's true in your life. The good news is God says, you don't have to. That's why I sent Jesus to come and do it for you. God is certified with his own blood, the blood of his son, that he counts us as righteous when he sees genuine faith. Now, I love this last part of this section of Genesis as this story continues. The Lord said to Abraham, I want you to know something for certain, that for 400 years, your descendants are going to be strangers in a country that's not their own. He's talking about Egyptian captivity. And they're going to be enslaved and they're going to be mistreated there, but I'm going to punish that nation that they serve as slaves. And afterward, they're going to come out with great possessions. And then he says, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here because the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Here's what God is saying. This is so important. Abraham, before all these promises are fulfilled, before you inherit the land and you become a great nation and all that, you're going to go through miserable times. Your ancestors are. They're going to be mistreated. They're going to be taken captive. See, God is prophesying, and he's right, exactly what's going to happen in the future. Isn't it comforting to know, brothers and sisters, that God is in control of human history? That doesn't mean that he controls every single aspect of it. Not everything that happens is God's will. But the good thing for us to know, and this is what Abraham, this is the promise God was making to Abraham. Abraham, I want you to know something. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what people do. It doesn't matter how evil people get. It doesn't matter how full of iniquity and sin the Amorites, which were the Canaanites who inhabited the land, it doesn't matter how bad they get. I want you to know something. My, I'm going to keep my promise. I said I was going to do it, and I'm going to do it. And the same thing is true for us today. I get fed up with the world in which we live, don't you? Especially in the election year, when you hear all this banter back and forth. And especially this year of 2020, when hardly anything has gone right. And there's so much tumult and so much violence, and so much hatred, and discord, and division in our country, and it makes us fearful for the future, doesn't it? Here's what we need to know. God says, I want you to know something. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter how bad things get in the United States. It doesn't matter what direction the world goes. I want you to know something. I'm going to keep my promises. I always keep my promises, no matter what happens, because I'm the Lord of history. And this last verse I love in Galatians. Paul said, if you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Jesus, if you have put your faith in Jesus through faith and repentance and baptism and shown God, I really believe what you said is true. I believe that Jesus paid the complete punishment for our sin on the cross, and I'm entrusting my life to you. If you've done that, he says, 
You're Abraham's seed and your heirs according to the promise. What is the promise? The promise is I'm going to count you as righteous when I see that faith. I count you as you're righteous. Now, you're not righteous, and I'm not righteous, but he counts me like I am. And as long as you continue to have faith, not perfect faith, but as long as you're headed in the direction, you're not perfection, but you're heading in the direction, as long as you're doing that, that is always the case. Brothers and sisters, that's how you know that you can have, that's how you know that you're going to have eternal life. Not because you're perfect, not because you keep God's law perfectly, not because you do what you know you should do perfectly. None of us does that. This is how you know. God's made a promise. And it doesn't matter how bad the world situation gets. Nothing can thwart God's ultimate outcome because he certified it with the death of his son, Jesus Christ. And so if you're a person who has put your faith and trust in Jesus, I want you to know something. Your salvation is assured as long as you continue to walk in his direction. Faithfully, not perfectly. You're going to heaven. And I hope that helps some people live a much more of a victorious life. And if you're not a Christian, the only way to be saved is to be counted as righteous because you're not righteous. There is no way your works can save you. You might be the best person in the world. You might do more good things than anybody. That's not even close to saving you. You have to have the blood of Jesus. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit will take the truth of his word, will seem in it in your heart and life today. And if you need to respond and make any kind of changes in your walk with the Lord, I just pray that you'll do that today. Let's all stand together while we sing this song of encouragement. What can wash away my sin? pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're grateful for your presence with us today, and we ask for your blessings upon our country and our leaders, and we're thankful that because of our faith, you will continue to bless this church, and you will indeed find us righteous, and our salvation will be intact. Father, as we leave this place, we pray that we would be Christ-like, people would see that, we would have influence over them, we would be able to change their lives and they would accept you, your son, as their savior. Go with us as we continue through this week and help us to make 
our country a better place and influence as many people as we can to live in harmony and love each other and be patient and kind and forgiving. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.